As we continue our teaching based upon Matthew 7, the fourth message in the Life Paths series involves security. Is it enough to just say the right things? How necessary is it to do God's will? Have you built your life on a foundation of rock or sand? Just how do you make Jesus the authority over your life? Let's join Pastor Seth. As we continue our teaching based upon Matthew 7, the fourth message in the Life Paths series involves security. Is it enough to just say the right things? How necessary is it to do God's will? Have you built your life on a foundation of rock or sand? Just how do you make Jesus the authority over your life? Let's join Pastor Seth. You know, Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount uh, probably took him maybe 30 minutes tops. It's taken me 22 weeks to get through here. He was a little bit more concise than I was. Three chapters, 22 weeks. But this is it. Today we finish the Sermon on the Mount, the end of Matthew 7. Uh, now, being a pastor and speaking every week, I'm always interested to hear how pastors finish their message. Uh, what do they go for? What do they do? And here we come to the conclusion, kind of the last, how is he going to wrap up this great sermon that we've been studying all these weeks. Is it enough just to say the right things as a Christian? Well, there are two sort of roads that we've talked about. There's God's road, where he's, in, he's the bus driver of my life. Every other road in life that we think we're taking has us driving the bus of our life. Uh, no matter which direction we're going, from his point of view, there are just two roads. And, um, but he says, as he finishes up this sermon that there are a couple side roads that you may think are this road, but they're really over there. These are what, this is what he's going to warn us about as he finishes the message. There are two catastrophic counterfeits to real Christian faith. Just a verbal profession of faith, which is what I had when I was growing up. And then secondly, just an intellectual knowledge about the faith. Neither one of these are what... He's after when he's trying to work in our lives. All right, let's look at our passage for today. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, growing up, I would have said, Lord. I knew Jesus Christ. That's, that's title. That's the Lord. And... What he does here is he takes the people who are listening in the present and he propels them far into the future at what he, what he will later call the great white throne judgment. Imagine yourself there one day. We will all be there one day, along with millions and millions of others. And there's going to be one group of people who are saying, Lord, Lord, what do you mean we're not going into heaven? Now, our secular world, of course, believes that virtually everybody's going to go to heaven, except for Adolf Hitler and maybe Idi Amin and a few other, you know, really out there folks. But everybody else. But nobody would ever imagine that at that day at the great white throne judgment, if you're saying, Lord, Lord, you got the name right, that maybe somehow that's not enough. He goes into the, on that day, verse 22, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? You would look at these folks and you would think, man, they're shoe-ins. You know, they're sort of shoe-ins like I thought I was. Now, I would have said, uh, not these three things, but I would have said, I went to church. I knew the gospel. I sang in the choir. I served as an acolyte. I helped the priest with communion. Is that good? They're good things. But that's not being on this road. Because over here, I can do religious things or good deeds and still be the bus driver of my life. Doesn't matter if I'm doing religious things. Doesn't matter if I'm irreligious. If I'm driving the bus, that's not a good thing, as Jesus has told us from the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, verse 21, let me, let me go back to repeating what Jesus said. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Not enough just to say the right things or know the right things. But is there some evidence that I really am walking on this road and I see some fruit of that? Is my will really submitted to do his will more than it is to do my will? Now, I'm always going to battle that, and so will you. But there ought to be some evidence that I'm trying to live over here. I'm trying to submit myself daily to God and do what he wants me to do because I know if I just do what I want to do, I'm going to screw this thing up. Now, this is what he tells them. He tells this group of people who are standing on this side of the white throne judgment, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, imagine if you were there. You suddenly realized you were not going to be allowed to get into heaven. And as you think about why, you say, well, apparently, Lord, Lord wasn't enough. And what he's really highlighting is this last part. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, what's the most natural question that you would want to ask yourself at that point? It's simply this. Did I not do what God wanted me to do? Was, was he not driving the bus? That's what you would expect these folks to respond with. But they illustrate how they've lived all their life by their response next to this statement. Let's go to the next verse. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? Did we not go to church? Did we not give to the church? Did we not help out at, at um, fall festival and go to the Christmas show? In other words, they didn't answer the question at all. They didn't deal at all with who's driving the bus. Is it God driving the bus or am I driving the bus? They illustrated if I just know what to do and I do a few good religious things or good deeds, that should be enough. And then he says, then I will declare to them, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Now, I'm sure that they were shocked by that as well. Uh, I run across very few people who would consider themselves an evildoer. I guess most people consider themselves a do-gooder. Not in the stupid sense, but in the I try to do good. Uh, I'm, I'm not an evil doer. And what we usually think of evil is somebody who does things that I don't do. I don't do those. I must be good. Now, again and again and again in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tries to put uh, the cookies on the bottom shelf for us. And here, what does it mean to be an evil doer? We certainly think about big things, murder, rape, all those kind of things, stuff going on in ISIS. But we don't think about our everyday life or what Dr. Laura Schlesinger calls everyday evil. What he's saying is, is that you're on this road. If that's how you think, if that's how you see life, if that's your responses to the people in your life, that you live on this road and that's how you think, you are badly mistaken. It doesn't matter if you do an occasional good thing here or there. You're a mess. You're not going to like it in heaven. You're going to find that really irritating. Now he illustrates this with a great story, great parable. One that probably most of you are familiar with. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them. Here's these words and does them. We'll be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon the house. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So there's the first picture. You got a guy who's building a house. He builds his house, gets it all done. He's been sure to build it on a foundation of rock. At some point, the storm comes, blows against that house. Think about um, tornadoes in Kansas. Place is just leveled. That house is still standing. Then he contrasts that with the second. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house. It fell, and great was the fall of it. 
Now, in this particular, these two stories, there are some similarities. You've got two men who are building a house. And someday their house is assaulted by a torrential storm. Think of a, a, a typhoon, a hurricane, a tornado, a tsunami. And there's some contrasts in the story. One man built his house on the rock. One man built his house on the sand. One man's house stood when the storms of life hit. One man's, storm, one man's house was devastated by, by the uh, storm. Now, what was the difference? They both heard God's word. But this guy was thinking, how can I put that into practice? How am I going to line up my life more along this road? And this guy is over here thinking, hey, that's a pretty good message. I like that. I know somebody that should have been here to hear that. Maybe my spouse. Maybe a friend. Hey, is anybody going to lunch? Let's go to lunch. That's the second person. And at some point, the, the, the uh, storm comes. Now, if you had been a casual observer of these two guys, you would have seen both these guys putting up the walls of their house, putting up the trusses over, up there roofing the houses. If you're living in California, stuccoing the houses, putting in the windows. You would have seen them inside painting. Maybe the wives are there putting up drapes. We're getting the kitchen all done. And this could go on for years. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And it looks to the casual observer that there's really no difference between this house and this builder and this house and this builder until the storms of life hit. And then you can tell. And there's no difference, no, no trouble, depending on the difference, but, or looking at the difference between the two people. What he's talking about is, is not, how am I constructing the house? What he's talking about is, how am I constructing the foundation? Building on the rock is, I hear God's word, and I'm thinking, how do I line myself up with what I heard today? Or what I read in the morning, tomorrow morning. Or if you're doing devotions, how do I line myself up, stay on this road? The other guy's saying, that's a good message. I like that. Hey, let's go eat. Sand. Now, Jesus in Luke 6 adds one other detail. Luke adds another detail that Matthew didn't include. He's like a man building a house who dug deep. He dug deep and laid the foundation upon rock. So this guy over here was intentional about, he was making some effort, building in the rock, and he's going to dig deep so it makes sure that he, he gets it there. And then he talks about, let's go to the next slide, about building on, um, building on the sand. Matthew 7, 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not, does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house. It fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, we've had several tsunamis in the last uh, 10 or 12 years How, in, in, in the world. How many of you have seen at least one clip of a tsunami. It's come in, yeah, uh, Bande Aceh in Indonesia, Japan, several of these. Uh, James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Oh, I had a good, good time in the word this morning. I got some really good stuff out of it. I had a good message. Well, I really needed to hear that. Verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But he who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer that forgets, but a doer that acts, he shall be blessed in his doing. Now, the prophet Ezekiel, uh, when he was in exile and the people were in exile, uh, he would speak to the people. And here's a little excerpt here that God 
tells him about. As for you, son of man, meaning the prophet Ezekiel, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the word is that comes forth from the Lord. Sounds good, doesn't it, so far? Come, it comes, time to go. Hear what Ezekiel's going to say to us. And they come to you as people come. They sit before you as my people. They hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with their lips, they show much love, but their heart. And this is what he's been talking about in the Sermon on the Mount in here for 22 weeks. The heart. Their heart is set on their own game. Verse 32. And lo, you are to them like one who sings love songs. With a beautiful voice. Oh, Seth, it was so good today. Yeah, I want to go back and hear that message. Oh, it was great. Or plays well on an instrument. Oh, man, that Brad was awesome on the keyboard. I was great today on the piano. Wow. That's what they're walking away with. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. Will not do it. Sermon on the Mount's done. He finishes with a story. Two builders. Storm hits. House still stay on the rock. This one, all I see is sand. Everything else is gone. What's interesting to me is what was the effect of the Sermon on the Mount on those folks on that hill that day? And Matthew tells us. This is pretty cool. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not like their scribes. Now, in our culture, we, I hear people all the time talk about, I don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. I believe in a Jesus who just wants us to love everybody and just be tolerant of everybody. I don't believe in a Jesus that... that that uh, teaches about hell. I just believe on, in the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount. And when I hear that, I think, have you even read the Sermon on the Mount? You would never say what you just said if you read it one time. Because from beginning to end, he says that the... It, this is not a question of just do whatever you want to and God's going to let everybody in. Over and over again for 22 weeks. Two roads. Most of you are probably sick of these two roads. You'll probably be glad when those pictures are done. <laughs> two roads. And he warned about hell in the Sermon on the Mount. We studied that over several weeks. The problem, he says, from beginning to end is the two roads. Either there's the God road where God's the bus driver or there's the self road where self is the bus driver. Until you get this thing squared away, you are still on this side of life. And you may think things are going well for a while. And they may go well for a while. A few years. Ten years. Happily married. Kids are doing well. Career is good. Paying our bills. Fifteen years, twenty years. 25 years. Effects may not catch up with you for a long time. Suddenly, a torrential storm hits. And you look around and you go, what happened? What in the world happened? Now, what Jesus would say is, this should not be a surprise to anyone. All of us are builders. You're going to build your house over here on rock? Or you're going to build it on sand? Uh, your choice. Life will look just fine for a while until some storms hit that sand won't do. Uh, years ago, in the, uh, over in Britain, there was a sailor who got in big trouble. Uh, there was a breach of discipline, and his commanding officer uh, exerted some very severe di discipline on this particular sailor. He wanted to make a point to the sailor about how important it was to follow orders immediately. Now, 
Of course, some folks out there thought the commanding officer was too harsh, shouldn't have come down on the guy like he did. It was over-the-top discipline. And it made the papers, and there was an outcry on the news, and the editor of one of the papers decided he wanted everybody to write in, and was the fella over the top on his discipline, or uh, was it appropriate? You know, one of those just stupid news things you hear about. Well, one guy wrote in, and he was uh, a sailor. Uh, he'd retired, and he said that he didn't think the discipline of the sailor was over the top because discipline on a ship is so important that sometimes it can save your life. And he told the story. He said he was on a ship one time. Uh, there were rough seas, and they were towing a large warship behind them with uh, a hauser. Now, it's not spelled like, you know, there's a W in there somewhere. Um, but a, uh, think of a big, thick steel cable pulling this large warship behind them through rough seas. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the commanding officer on the deck said, Down! And everybody went down just like that. What happened next was the cable had snapped. And it was coming back from the large warship back towards their boat. And it swept right across that deck about that high. If anybody had not obeyed at that instant, they would have been cut in half. If somebody had said, why do I have to go down? It's really not convenient for me. Why do I have to do that? That's not all that important. You know, I might be able to get around to that in about 20 minutes. They would have been doing a burial at sea with two body parts of his, a top and a bottom. Jesus could have illustrated, I guess, the end of the sermon, Sermon on the Mount with that story as well. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just acknowledge to you that we are, we are really great at hearing. But when it comes to doing, well, that, that's another matter. And then when the storms of life hit, most of the time we blame you. I haven't really thought much about if we've built our house on sand or not for a lot of years. Maybe if we've gotten nothing out of the Sermon on the Mount so far except... Oh, that's really good stuff. Maybe today we'll get something else. I better be a doer. I want to build my house on rock. And Father, we just acknowledge to you that unless you work in our hearts, unless you help us see this and own it, and to say, I do not want to be a person who hears only and build my house on the sand... That is foolish. And unless you help us to see that, we'll just go gliding on in our life. As long as life is 72 degrees with a slight offshore breeze. That is until the tsunami hits. Work in our hearts, Holy Spirit. Sweep through this place today. Awaken us to the two stories that you told to finish this message. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.